Now, Harrison knew he couldn't just attack the village because he's so outnumbered. But what he did is he made an, a fortified encampment, basically dug a square little fortification on the other side of Tibby Canoe Creek from Prophetstown and waited. Dug in with his cannon near the front. And every night for a week, the young men in Prophetstown will go to the prophet and beg him to attack. You promised us. You promised that we could defeat that the bullets would bounce off us. You promised. And finally, he couldn't hold back anymore. On November 7th, 1811, the Battle of Tippecanoe. Canoe. And arguably the most important battle between the United States and American Indians. Arguably. It is. 1811. Okay. November 7th. The big thing we need to know is 1811. This is the watercolor of it. It wasn't quite like this because there really wasn't a bayonet charge. They were done in. And that's the only thing that saved them. You can imagine the way that they attacked. You're the very, you know, they're from all these different tribes, but they can they're convinced that they're invulnerable. So they just did these human wave assaults. And they just got mowed down in waves. And no, they probably weren't wearing just uh, or half naked like this, which in the summer that would have been normal, but it was November, it was cold. But, anyways, they just attacked in waves and grape shot just cut them down. But they nearly broke through a couple times and they nearly won. But at the end of the day, Harrison's men held their line and it was a victory. Not just any victory, the most decisive defeat of American Indians in history. This battle would change everything. In fact, the battle was so decisive, it changed the way people thought about themselves. In fact, they forgot that the battle did it, thought they always thought this way. And it's such a big deal. And so Harrison's going to be old tip for the rest of his life. But these are the two reasons why it's so decisive. What do you think happened to that Confederacy? Dead. You think anyone's going to join from down here? No way. They said no, the Confederacy in the North broke up. Tecumseh's Confederacy died. Tecumseh went north. He actually had to flee to Canada with a few, maybe a thousand uh, men. And that's why, and that's why it's so decisive. That's it. That was the last chance that American Indians had to stop the expansion of the United States and whole part of their land. That was it. Has everyone got that? That was the last chance. Never again will there be enough powerful Eastern tribes that they unify can stop the United States. Won't happen again. So every battle afterwards, including one of the biggest in the most famous one probably in the United States, happened in Montana. What battle? That was a victory by the Lakota and the Cheyenne, yet it's just all part of a tragic, long last stand. The United States is going to win. They're going to conquer this land, and, and in essence, the United States would decide when and how they would destroy the tribes. There's no chance. It's not over now. It's not like all of a sudden November 8th. It's over! But this is the key. This moment. Never again could there be a shot. It's a pretty important battle. Pretty important. No. <laughs> See? As the earthquake shows. But! It's going to take a while for them to realize it. It's not going to be like all said, oh, we won. And then one more big thing. One more big thing. What do you call that feeling when you love your country? Nationalism. nationalism. A new form of nationalism will come out of the United States. Harsh out of War of 1812. Tippy Canoe was actually a bigger deal. Before Tippy Canoe, before this era, what did American Indians represent to a lot of Americans? <laughs> Liberty, freedom. Oh yeah, they wanted their land, and there were some contradictory feelings, but they had this kind of positive feeling like, wow, they were the freest people we've ever seen. Nobody is like them. We admire them. That totally changed. They went from these free people to savages. They're on our land. They're pests taking up our land. Wasting it. Justifying taking it. We're not taking it from people who believe in liberty. We're taking it from a bunch of lice. Yes, they were calling that. And what a big shift. They dehumanized them to make it, to justify taking the land. 
That's a big shift. Once again, not overnight, but you can see it. And that's what I mean by like 30, 40 years. That's what everyone, you know, we always thought that, didn't we? You know, it's memory change in the 1850. Yeah, we always thought that, didn't we? I mean, that's what it's always been. And then, as part of this, it was 1800, and you saw, and somebody said, hey, look, there's a bunch of Americans. People would have assumed you're talking about American Indians. After Tippecanoe, that would begin to shift. Citizens of the United States started calling themselves Americans. That's a big change. We are Americans. Think about that for a second. So the early what's that? Huh? The early 1800s. Yeah. Was when American Indians would have been called Americans. What a big shift! You think about that for a second. Yeah. So this like started it like when do you think it like? Well, right after right after this battle, we started shifting more and more to this is we are on 1811. Does that make sense? I mean, yeah, I don't yeah, remember sense, but like when like the like a total transition. Yeah, we're gonna see it over the next about twenty years. But this is like the moment, like this is a like change happening. And think about it for a second. Nobody else on these on this continent, the Americans, <laughs> call themselves Americans. You know, Mexicans don't, Argentinians don't, Canadians don't. We do. It's our continent. We are the Americans. We own it. Nobody else does. Yeah. So when was it changed from the United States to the United States? So it was always the United States of America, they just didn't call themselves Americans. Uh, they would have said, I'm a Virginia, New Yorker. And think about that for a second. It's our continent. Why? Because we're citizens of the United States, therefore we are special. Because we're Americans. And why are we Americans? Because we're citizens of the United States. And we are special. And why are we special? That's nationalism. It's not for what we did. It's not for what we believe in. It's just the fact that simply put, we're Americans and therefore we're special. Yeah, it's a little Arab. It is. Nationalism has that thing. Now think about it for a second. Once you decide you're special, I'm special. You're not. But I am. Why? Can't I do things? Don't that justify me doing a lot of stuff because I'm special? No. I'm better at you, so I can do things. No. What do you think every war is going to be about in the 20th century? Nationalism. I'm better than you. We are better than you. You are inferior. I don't think it's all bad, but it's pretty scary. If it really can go overboard, and it has happened here. It already happened, happening again. It's happened to every country that does this. So this is a big shift. I can't emphasize this enough. And so, with that, one last thing. Who's army? The concept? Who? The British. The British. The British. And so even after Tippy Canoe, they're saying, we, the British are going to come back. And that would be the push to war. The concept. After the defeat at Tippy Canoe, it's like, well, we can't let them come back again. And they also blame the British for the Creek and the Choctaw, the Chickasaw, who are fighting so hard to keep their land down here. The British weren't helping them, but let's blame them too. Right? Who's the boogeyman? The British. And yes, I would argue both bad things in the world you can blame on the British. Oh. I just broadcast that around the world. So, with that, <laughs> and I am, my, my partridge is a British name. Huh? But you're, you're American. But I'm an American. So take that, Britain. All right, so. Oops. You want to see the duel? Should we do the duel? All right, so. We're going back in time. Let's do it very quickly, 1804. There are a lot of duels, and they have very specific rules. But by the 18th century, especially, I mean, dueling is murder. Yeah. Yeah. If you go and carry a gun to someplace with the expectation of shooting somebody else, murder. yes, and that's a capital offense. And what does that mean in 1804, especially? Yeah. Yeah. You'll be hanged. 
So, they had all these rules for dueling, but the thing was, the, poli the political system was so new, how do you deal with political disagreements? Does somebody disagree with you just because you're a position, or are they dishonoring you? Dueling. And so Hamilton and Burr, we've already talked about why they were already mad at each other, right? Well, this is what happened. By 1804, both men are actually very much discredited. Hamilton not has nobody really likes Hamilton. He's very arrogant. He has no real friends. His political power is diminishing. So you look at it, you know, think about a guy who's like, I'm trying to reestablish myself. And there's Burr, who is like at the total bottom. 1800, he kind of humiliated himself by trying to maintain the presidency, humiliated for the governor's race in 1802, and he's going to get involved with a conspiracy to break off New England and form its own country. His reputation is in the dirt. No way Jefferson's going to pick him and be vice president again, or the Republicans pick him. And so, both men are trying to reestablish themselves. So they're doing a letter writing campaign where they're, they are their allies were writing letters to newspapers that were allied to them in New York. Well, the last straw was when Hamilton, in a letter, referred to Burr as a man who does not know what the truth looks like. Meaning he is a liar. liar. And that was one that Burr said, I can't let this stand. And so he challenged Hamilton to a Burr. Because his name and his reputation have been dishonored. Now, Hamilton thought immediately, now wait a minute, you've already dishonored yourself. But here's Hamilton, he's got to stand up for it. Yeah. You said he challenged Hamilton to a bird. That's it. Did I really yeah, say yeah, that? Yeah. <laughs> you were also <laughs> so like, like, That's the problem. I'm actually kind of thinking about what I'm going to say in advance, so I'm not really focused on what I'm saying now. <laughs> it's really a bad habit. <laughs> I challenge you to be Burr. I mean, I, I challenge you to become Aaron Burr. <laughs> I challenge you to a, I, I challenge you to a duel for dishonoring me, and you get to pick the weapon. Now, a couple things about them. There are duels challenged all the time, but most people are not psychopaths, and they actually don't want to kill somebody. Really? I know that's right. Thankfully, and so. A lot of times, so let's say I challenge someone to do it, we, boom, we're going to fight a duel, right? We basically both just say, I challenge you, you accept, okay, are we running away? We accept that we both are willing to do it, good enough. We both were willing to defend our honor, but we're not going to kill each other. So basically, it just became kind of a symbolic thing. Which, how many people are thinking, oh, you weenies. <laughs> <laughs> and if you're all like that, I'm not going to turn my back on but, when, and then sometimes they would just show up. I'm here, you're here, okay. We're going on. Or sometimes shoot the ground or, or shoot the ground or the air. And, uh, and so, Hamilton, who didn't really want to duel, and later on people would say, oh, he hated dueling and stuff. You know, that might be, but he actually had a set of, especially in a dueling pistols. So that appears to be kind of a, you know, you know, looking back and trying to rehabilitate his reputation. Now, what's a dueling pistol? So you say a pistol for a duel, then I throw it. A single shot. Well, they're all single shot. It's a rifle barrel, so it's accurate to about three yards. And so pretty accurate for close range, and it had a hair trigger. What's hair trigger? <laughs> hair trigger that has like a... You know, I don't want to say it's safety, but you can pull it back a ways and then back to the trigger part. So it's a spring loaded first trigger that hits a second trigger. And, pull it. and once, so you can have it like literally like all the way pulled. Yeah. Basically. So then right there, all you have to do is have it and it's gone. Yeah. And so it's designed to be really far fast, but has a little bit of a cushion. Yeah. So you know, you don't have so to. Oh, whoops. And Which, of course. <laughs> Could that have happened here? I don't know. So Hamilton shows it, and they went to Waukegan Island, which is on the Hudson between New Jersey and New York. They chose that because right now it's, it's in New Jersey, but back then it wasn't clear. So if somebody's arrested, you get the point there. And they had all these elaborate things done so they could say like, they never planned this. I had no idea. So for example, the two rowboats who carried them out there, the men were told, you can't watch. 
So they would all supposedly turn their back so they couldn't see what was happening. And they could all swear, and they would all swear to this. I never saw the pistols because they carried a box. So they could all say, I never saw the pistols, I saw a box. So if there is a trial, so they could all have plausible deniability. Because let me tell you something about a trial. Let's say it's a trial for murder. Let's say it's the Aaron Burr, right? All Burr needs to do is find an excuse for the jury to acquit him. He doesn't need to prove he's innocent. He doesn't even need to prove it as self-defense or anything else. He just has to give an excuse for the jury to acquit him. To get one or two people to say he's not guilty. That's all they gotta do. That's what trials are to this day. You're not necessarily proving actual fact or reality. You're just giving the jury a reason to find guilty or in or acquit. Which should also be kind of scary about the court system, isn't it? But that's the reality of it. So, here we have, they leave the boat, five men. There's a judge chosen by Hamilton, and then, because he's the guy who got challenged, and they went to this cliff overlooking the water, probably chosen by Hamilton, but that's still up in the air, and then each man had a second. And so you can see from this picture, which I love this picture, because that's Burr, and I love how he fired. Not the most accurate way. And what would happen is, what's this? You ever seen the duels where they do the you know, stand back to back, right? No, they didn't do that. The judge would mark off 20 paces. So 20 yards, the pistols are out, and they would stand there like this. They would not stand like that picture because that's a bigger target. But they couldn't wear a cloak or anything that would hide their body. So they're like this, looking at you. So if I'm Burr, I'm like this. And they're waiting for the signal from the judge. Sometimes we like drop a handkerchief and when it hits, I'm like three claps, something like that. Now, Burr's second will be off to the side and kind of see him there. And he, this is all for this plausible deniability. Burr's here, the judge is looking at, or his second's looking at Hamilton like this. So he can say if it goes to court, I never saw what Burr did, but I know Hamilton shot. Self-defense. And then the judge is out in the middle, and he says, I was just looking forward. I didn't even know. I just saw some someone shot. I have no idea. So they can all act like they didn't see it to give an excuse. So he's looking at Burr, Ham or looking at Hamilton, Hamilton second looking at Burr. Now, sometimes they get their 20 faces, look at each other, and go home. Or shoot in the air or ground. And this is where it gets confusing. So let's get back to Hamilton. I'll keep I'll keep in character. Burr's over there. That's like natural born thespian. So the judge clapped, boom, and then what did they do? No, they just stood there and stared at each other for a while. You don't have to shoot. And by the way, Andrew Jackson fought over 100 duels. He his advice to people fighting a duel would be to fire first or second. 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 So you decide. You decide what to do. Jackson figured correctly it's very difficult to shoot somebody and they'll miss. And then I will decide to miss or to wing you or to kill you. So you only get one shot? You get one shot. We'll talk about Andrew Jackson. There's so much misinformation about Jackson right now. It's kind of funny. But we'll get to it. So Hamilton's here, and after a couple seconds, he brought the pistol down and then did what? Shot in the air. And the textbook says that he purposely did that, didn't it? Mm -hmm. We don't know. He said that afterwards. It would take him a day and a half to die. In agony. He said that afterwards. But of course, he could be just saying, you know, that trying to make himself look better, to make his reputation better. Could have been that hair trigger because it was partially pulled. Bang. We don't know. But he fired the air. Burr swore that he could hear. The musket ball go by his ear. So he he said, I thought Hamilton was aiming for me and I had no choice. And of course, yes, he did have a choice. <laughs> Hamilton didn't have a bullet, but yeah. so it probably seems like Burr meant to do it. Burr was thinking, I'm gonna get it. And so Burr took careful aim, and I always wonder at that moment what Hamilton was thinking, standing there looking at him. And what happened? Then right on this side, right here. Pretty much crumbled four ribs, and what's the organ that's right here? Right to the liver, collapsed the lung, 
which I guess is the most excruciating pain you can imagine. <laughs> There's a lot of very painful things. And then you have to take him a day and a half to die. Burr would be acquitted, but that kind of ended dueling. But that's how you fight a duel. Now, he could have chosen other weapons. Usually it would be a sword, a knife, a spoon, a mace. <laughs> what was a mace? <laughs> yeah, a <bit. laughs> yeah. So they almost always show space. So did you only get like one thing? No, you just went out and you went at it. <laughs> no, you're 20 paces, you're throwing. <laughs> so, with that, that is the duel. Hamilton, Hamilton, uh, and of course, here is the very dramatic death of Hamilton. And they live for another day. I mean, that must have been just unbelievable. So, we really don't know what Hamilton was thinking, what Burr is thinking. I'll tell you one more duel story when I tell you about Andrew Jackson. Sure, one guy. Was it? The one guy. <laughs> the one guy. I, think, I don't think I know what you're saying, so we'll save it. So, good story. And so let's get to the war. So that's the War of 1812, and it ended with guys on ships. Okay. Then, then Nixon would resign, and Ford became president. We're jumping right into 74, right? Everyone good with that? Yeah. This is actually the Battle of Cunin Bay or Lake Erie. And you know, they always show them. There's Commodore Oliver Hazard Perry with a few American victories. And yes, that is an awesome name. Oliver Hazard Perry. But a group of young congressmen were all elected in 1810, all Republicans, young men, and they were all for war with Britain. They blame the British for trouble on the frontiers. They're mad about the commercial aspect of it, the orders in council, that sort of thing. Felix Grundy actually looked like he might be a very prominent politician, but he got very ill at a young age. But Henry Clay is going to become one of the most important politicians of this era. He is going to be involved in everything for the next 40 years. So Clay is going to be this huge politician. And then that other guy. And so those are, who's the other guy? John C. Calhoun. I didn't break it. I didn't. It deserved to break. John C. Calhoun. Arguably one of the most horrible men ever lived. But what happened? Yeah, there's a picture. I don't know who made that picture. I have no idea who made that picture. John C. Calhoun, a horrible man. By the way, looks that's Calhoun. To me, that's not Calhoun. Let's get to a pitch, a photo of him from the 1846 with new photography. The mouse is broke. <laughs> there we go. Yay! That no. Okay, that's a great picture, right? Everyone likes that picture. Wait, wait, wait. Look at it's got like six joints. <laughs> it's not bad. It's like a vampire. That is an awesome picture. The only name you need to know is Henry Clay. Henry Clay of Kentucky and John C. Calhoun. You won't you need to know Grundy. And so that's Calhoun. You want to see one more picture? Yeah. Oh, we got to turn the lights off. Now, <laughs> when I show you this picture, I want you to do one thing. Look into his eyes. No matter where you're at in this room, look into his eyes. All right? Look at him. He's staring at you. He's not staring at you. He's staring into Now, there's two things. What is he holding? He's crushing a kid. <gasps> it's not a kid's a pop. So, oh, it's me oh, here. It's not. No. <laughs> and one more thing. And this might be the best part. You ready? You ready? <laughs> neck hair. That's neck hair right here. Yeah. Awesome. Is that what you meant? 
<laughs> neck hair. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's just what he says. And it's just, it's just kind of an illusion. But hmm? what does the class very across from here think we do? They think. So, <laughs> and one more thing. I will give you an extra credit then to dress up <laughs> in December. And I limit you just a couple choices. And I know what you're saying. That's totally unfair and arbitrary. <laughs> and this, yes, right there. With the neck hair? Oh, you got to have neck hair. <laughs> and there'll be one more person I'll let you choose, and you'll see exactly why I choose these two. Oh, we'll get to them. We'll get to them. You only get two. And it's totally unfair as the, as the shaking shows you. So, Madison did not want war. But the Warhawks, but especially Tippy Canoe, would push Madison to finally ask for a declaration of war. And the date isn't so important. You know, I put June 19th. Remember, things take a while for it to happen, and you do not need to write down the vote. But I want to show you how close it was in the House. But there's one more thing. This I do want you to write down. Federalists in the Northeast all voted against it. So this was only a war. A sectional war for the West and the South. The three stated reasons for neutrality rights, like those orders in council, security along the frontier, they blamed the British for all those fights, and Canada. Those were the three big reasons, but the Northeast was totally opposed. They voted against it. Now, here's the thing neutrality rights, they're stopping American merchant ships. Most of the American shippers were from what part of the country? The Northeast. So in reality, these are the two biggest reasons for the war. Those are the reasons. That's what the West and South cared about. And to be blunt about it, this was to destroy the American Indians on the frontier so the United States can take their land. And that's what it is. And then also, these are a bunch of plantation owners in the South. They're obsessed with land. There's a lot of land in Canada. Now, I'm just saying, not very good for tobacco, but we're just thinking land. And the assumption was that the Canadians would want to become citizens of the United States. As it would turn out, no. And they would fight really, really, really hard. They were British subjects. And the French Canadians did not trust the United States either. So, a couple of things about this. Now we have war. That's another picture of Put in Bay. So, that's Oliver Hazard Perry right there of watercolor. I just like the fact that he's holding the sword. That just kind of makes me laugh. That sword's so big. Yeah, the sword is huge. And if you look carefully in the back, look behind the ship. You see it in the boat? Walrus. So, with that, I gotta raise this. So, don't write all this down. I'll tell you a couple of things we need to write down, but very quickly, this war is going to be dubbed Mr. Madison's War, which is so ironic because he didn't want the war. But now it's Mr. Madison. Oh, oh gosh, I forgot something. Just put about neutrality rights. Ironically, a week before the declaration of war, Britain repealed the orders in council. Their textile mills were burning for lack of cotton. They repealed the order of council. But what's the problem? A week before the declaration of war? Mm -hmm. Like yeah. How do you tell them? And by the time the United States found out, it's too late. What did they do? They repealed that orders in council, the blockade, at least the stopping of American ships. This won't happen again, but like something like perhaps will end the war, and then there'll be a massive battle two weeks after. That won't happen in this war, will it? No. No way. So we had some communication issues. So this is what you need to know about Mr. Madison's war. The Federalists were totally opposed, so do write down that. And that includes New England. Just wouldn't support them. And I put down these numbers just to give you an idea. So you can write down however you want to put like the military is unprepared. But I just put down these numbers. You don't need the numbers, just the military is unprepared. But look, 6,700 man army, that's a tiny army. It would go up to 35,000, but most of them are militia. And then look, the US had only 16 total ships in its navy, and only seven were serviceable. No ships of the line, battleships. The British had 200 ships of the line alone, and almost a thousand other ships. 
And the last thing we do need to know, the bus, the charter expired. The financial system was in chaos. A terrible time to fight the war. And then you don't need to write down the thing about the tariffs because we couldn't fight the tariffs. And New England just missed it out of the war. And we'll come back to this. So these are the big three. So the U.S. was totally unprepared. The only, the only thing that saved the United States from complete destruction was the fact that the British were already involved in what? Yeah, right. their own war. And ironically, that year Napoleon, when the war was declared, it's just getting ready to invade what country? Russia. Well, Russia. Russia. Now you think, what's the British? Well, the British realize Napoleon is trying to do a knockout war to the Russians. That means he's vulnerable in other places, and they sent more troops to Spain. So they're fighting, trying to find the weak underbelly of the French Empire in Spain. And because that's going on, they're preoccupied there. If they would have sent 30 or 40,000 troops to Canada, maybe, or 20,000 Canada and 20,000 Jamaica to attack that way in 1812, yeah, I, I don't know, it would have been bad. Probably broken up. Probably broken up. Yeah, the independent New England, I mean, it would have been. Who knows? You know, we'd be speaking Bulgarian. So with that, Madison would win re-election, but look at all those votes, anti-war votes in the Northeast. New York, for example, did not support the war at all. And so, a very divisive war, a war of choice and a mistake. Now, the U.S. had a grand strategy because we just assumed the Canadians would rise up. So it was a three-pronged attack on Canada. Here's Lake Champlain, Niagara, and Detroit, right there. Who's been to Detroit? So I know you were, because your brother told me. Are that tigers? Okay, How'd the invasion go? That's not strong enough. It didn't work. Utterly horrible. Okay, disaster. At Niagara, not only was the U.S. invasion defeated, but the New York militia, almost 5,000 men, refused to join. And so they sat on hills and watched the small of the U.S. Army get routed across the Niagara River. <laughs> 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 I bet you get rowdy like, <laughs> yeah. Sitting there, being chairs and popcorn. Yeah, I can see your chair. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> and then at Detroit, Detroit was such a humiliation. A, a small American army under Isaac Hall. General Hall was this uh, 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 fossil from the Revolutionary War. He had been in the army since. Oh, 1775, and he was not a very good general, but he just kind of stuck in the military, the tiny little army. Well, he commanded about 3,000 troops, most of them were militia. And they advanced that from Ohio, and they were going to cross over into the lower peninsula here of Canada. Well, they immediately turned around and ran back to the fort. And the fort's one of those masonry forts. It's a solid fort there. Now, back then in Detroit, very very heavily forested, a few clearings out in front of the fort. The British crossed over. The British had less than a thousand men and about a thousand that were remnants of Tecumseh's Confederacy and Tecumseh. And what they did is, inside of Fort, Detro Fort Detroit, but out of range, there was a big open clearing between two heavily forested areas. And what the British and Tecumseh did is, they lined up in column and marched out of the fort so the British or the American. Americans could see him march out of the forest, across the clearing, and then back into the forest, out of sight. And then followed by Tecumseh's men. And when the first British soldiers got out of sight of Fort Detroit, what did they do? They sprinted all the way around and marched across again. So what did General Hall think? And he surrendered without firing a shot. Oh, in the train. Hmm? In the train. Yeah. What a disaster to the British for what? Total bluff. Very clever. Because the British had usually less soldiers, but they were better trained. A lot of them were militia, too. There would be a couple battles in 1813, a big naval battle here in 1813. The 
colonial capital of York, which is today Toronto, a raid there, a small little raid, they burnt down the colonial capital, the US did. But for the most part, it went very badly, better in 1813. But this war was a terrible mistake. We're gonna jump right to the Battle of Lake Erie. The Battle of Lake Erie, a scratch fleet made by the US Navy on Lake Erie, Erie, Erie <laughs> would fight a British fleet. But both sides had about 18 ships. And partially because the British were preoccupied elsewhere, 1813 was the big year. Massive battles in what is now Germany and then into France against Napoleon. And the British were advancing out of Spain. So they're preoccupied. This victory, a big American victory on Lake Erie. And that is when Commander or Commodore Oliver Hazard Perry sent the great message back to President Madison. We have met the enemy and they are ours. That's just a great, I just love that sentence. And this is a big deal. Because if the British would have swept American forces clean off the Great Lakes, that would have had a big impact on the, on the treaty. And whatever negotiations it would have, the British would say, hey, the Great Lakes are ours. And it might have been hard to make it what it would eventually become for both countries, neutral. And then, the next month, the Battle of the Thames. And William Henry Harrison is on command. So this is Harrison's back. And they led troops into the lower peninsula. If you look right here, not about right here. But now it's a raid. And they met the same force of the British and Tecumseh. And what happened was at the Thames, the British abandoned the field, so only Tecumseh and his allies fought. And they were just overwhelmed. They fought, had a couple times where it looked like they might turn the tide, but at the end of the day, a decisive victory. Or not, not for the course of the battle, but a major defeat of the Comsa. In fact, the Comsa would be killed. I'll tell you the story about the Comsa, what happened there, maybe about time later on. But when it finished the rest of the war. But think about Harrison now, Tippy Canoe in the Thames. His career is set. For the rest of his life, he rested on those walls. That would get him the Congress and Governor of Indiana, and just this, one of the most famous Americans, 27 years after this battle. He'd run for president, and he was a old tip. Battle of the Thames, he killed Tecumseh. He'd be the oldest man elected president up to that time. He'd also be the first president to die in office. Die in office. Yeah. So this wasn't against the Indian Confederation, right? Because that was dead. The remnants of it. Okay. You know, the few it followers of like Tecumseh. Like so. Yeah, maybe a thousand men. Okay, but it, it's different than the Confederation. Yeah, it's when look at it, just a few of the men who followed Tecumseh. And they were from okay. a bunch of different tribes, but not the. Okay. So, with that, 1814, guess who's pretty much and then soon to be totally defeated? Napoleon. So, let's get them. The British are going to do a four pronged attack, a blockade, which was incredibly effective. Yeah, they blockaded before, but now they got almost the whole fleet. This blockade was so effective that it would change the course of American history. But also, I'll get to it. They attacked at Lake Champlain. They were going to raid up the Chesapeake and you burn our capital, we'll burn yours. At least a raid. And lastly, the big prize. Try to take New Orleans. So that's the plan. And it almost totally succeeded. Should I draw you a picture of this? Yes. The Battle of Lake Champlain. It's just, it's one of these things that the U.S., the scratch fleet built on Lake Champlain, they couldn't have stopped the British there. They could have went down the Hudson, and there's little doubt that New England would have succeeded. They were talking about it. Yeah. The Chesapeake. Take Washington, D.C. Did I go too fast? And yeah. Like that glared at me? Yeah. You know, and I know what you're thinking, and you're right. I'm not writing it down, so I'm not thinking about the time. It's actually faster to say something than write it down. Did you know that? What? That's science. Is that better? Yes. Sorry about that. Okay. I saw a few people look at me like. <laughs> hmm? Yeah, and that's what humans have great short-term memories. 
Okay, so let me draw you a picture. Are you, are you excited for this? I know I am. Lake Champlain is a long, skinny lake. Beautiful area. Who's been to upstate New York, anyone? So we have one. Now you can walk out of here and all of you can say, I've been there, right? Yes. You're welcome. So here's Lake Champlain. And yes, it's beautiful. It's stunning. It's got a slight curve. Now, I'm going to draw the Navy. You're looking down on the ships. Right? Looking down. Both sides had about 16 ships. And where are the guns on the ship? Side to side. Yeah. So they're on starboard or port hulls. So with that, what's that? Oh, Land wall ride. Yeah. Good, huh? They're big in upstate New York. The problem is this, it takes about five minutes to fight, to load after they fire. And the tactics where the British were gonna sail down and line up right here and try to blow them away. And so you fire once, it takes about five minutes. But since the United States is on the defense, it's relatively shallow in the part where they're defending and there's a strong current. What they did is this, I'll draw you a ship. That's pretty good, isn't it? Yeah, I don't want to brag. There's an anchor here, an anchor here. Just let me show you this real quick. They put down both anchors. They let they did that anchor. They they anchored it in. Then let this chain go. And what did the boat do in the current? It turned. So while it was turning, they're reloading. Then they would fire. And then how would they turn back? Reel the anchor in. The boat would turn. They double the firepower. One. The Americans did that. Isn't that clever? It only works. It's got to be pretty shallow. So like you couldn't do it in the middle of the sip. <laughs> Try your best to get through the weekend. I know it's tough. Two days without me. It's hard. Feel really your pain. Try to get through it. <laughs> Oh, we're just taking notes, Monday. Well, I gotta shut this off. I'm recording. I'm